Owls are a species that to many hold an almost spiritual connection. Capable of love and deep emotions, these monolithic and mysterious creatures have captivated the hearts and minds of humans for as long as we have existed. One third of the world's whale and dolphin populations are found in the waters of the Azores. Located in the mid-Atlantic, 1,500 kilometers from Europe and 2,500 kilometers from the US, these island chains were known for many years for the hunting of whales and have now emerged as one of the premier places in the world to observe them. And this is exactly what brought me back here to this spectacular island chain. Known to many as the Hawaii of Europe, the Azores are a spectacular place, the only archipelago in the world to be certified as a sustainable destination. I'm on the island of Fayel, and behind me you can see the town of Horta. I'm here to join an expedition with Biosphere Expeditions, some citizen scientists and real scientists. We're going to be out in the ocean photographing and tagging whales, dolphins, and sea turtles. I was so excited to head out on this research vessel, but first I wanted to explore the island. I had a couple hours to spare on the night I arrived and the next morning as I'd be meeting with my group in the afternoon. So on my first day, I took the evening to go on a short hike and catch the sunset. The next morning, I woke early, rented a scooter and took a scenic drive up to the caldera, which lies at the island's center. The Azores are a volcanic island chain, tips of ancient and growing mountains. This geology is one of the coolest things to see when visiting here, and I absolutely loved the caldera. Not only was there no one else around, but the clouds rolled in, and it was just absolutely magical. After that, I met up with my group at our shared house and began learning all about what we'd be researching. Good morning from the beautiful Banana Manor. This is my home for the next couple of days while I am here on this expedition. There's about 12 of us here and from all over the world, Germany, America, the UK. So it's a really fun group. It's very communal here. Everyone helps in making breakfast and making dinner. Uh, excited to see some whales out there. Okay, from here on out, I'm going to be spending each and every day at sea, whether there's big swells, sun or rain. So it should be a couple of interesting days out at sea. I'm here helping a scientist named Lisa Steiner. She's done some of the most long-term studies on sperm whales and baleen whales here in the Azores and has lived here for more than 30 years. What we're going to be looking for specifically is the whale flukes, AKA the whale tails. They're like a fingerprint. So we're gonna be trying to photograph them. And along with that, we'll be taking GPS data on different GPS devices. We'll be recording how many whales, how many dolphins we see, the different species, and a lot more data points that are not only used by Lisa in her studies, but shared by the university here in the Azores as well. Now we'll be specifically looking for baleen whales. These are toothless whales. So think humpback whales and blue whales. And they usually only migrate through the Azores between March and May as they head from the Arctic down to their summer feeding grounds. Now there's also a lot of sperm whales in the Azores. So we'll be definitely keeping an eye out for those as well. One of the things that's hard about doing whale research is that you need a lot of hands and a lot of eyes to be able to look for these whales and document it. So a program like this is really important because Lisa wouldn't be able to do it on her own in a really efficient way. And the other things with these big whales is that they're notoriously hard to tag and the tags don't stay on for very long periods of time. So these photograph ID programs where you're simply just trying to get an identification of the whale to compare to other data is a really important way to study them. We have been given a serious amount of information the last couple of hours learning how to fill out all of the different data sources so that we can record all of the different whale, dolphin, and turtle sightings that we have. This includes GPS coordinates, wind direction, and a ton of other stuff. We are just all gearing up, getting our warm clothes on, and about to head out to the ship for the first time. Now each day started with an early breakfast and then we hopped on board our boat around 9 a.m. spending the rest of the day at sea. All of us 
pilots on board have very different roles. Every day they rotate, and each one of them is equally important. Today, my job is to test the water temperature. I started testing it right when we came out of port. Every time we have a sighting of a whale or dolphin or turtle, I'm going to tell our document takers on top of the boat what temperature the water is, and this is used in their research, so it's pretty important. Every position was important. We had lookouts on each corner of the boat, photographers, GPS data takers, and several other data point entry positions recording any sightings of dolphins or whales while we were out at sea. Now, our first day, we spotted several pods of dolphins, both bottlenose and russos, as well as several sperm whales and even a baby sperm whale. I honestly didn't know much about sperm whales before coming on this trip, so let me share some of the things that I've learned. Sperm whales, they're the largest toothed whales in the world, and they were hunted near extinction all the way up until the 1950s for their fat that was used in everything from margarine to cattle fodder, dog food, vitamin supplements, glue, leather preservatives, and even brake fluid. The fluid is called spermaceti because people once believed it was actually sperm. Spoiler alert, it's not. As a liquid, it also fueled lamps, congealed, it could be fashioned into smokeless candles, fine soaps, and cosmetics. And once it was discovered, hundreds upon hundreds of ships from North America and Europe were soon plying the world's oceans in search of sperm whales, killing up to 5,000 whales a day in its height. Now, the spermaceti that sperm whales have in their heads is also highly buoyant, which allows the whales to float at the surface for long periods of time. And many sperm whales have been witnessed seemingly standing up in sleep states, a very peculiar sight. Outside of spermaceti being buoyant, it's also a great sound transmitter, and it's believed that this is what they use to produce the loud clicks and noises that they use for communication and stunning prey. These clicks are easy to detect with an underwater microphone called a hydrophone, which we used on several of the days at sea to find the location of the whales, but it was still no easy feat tracking them down. Sperm whales can stay underwater for more than an hour and oftentimes only surface for 10 to 15 minutes before diving again to depths of almost 6,000 feet. From a boat like ours, all one can see of a sperm whale is the tail and the broad slab of back and head that rides above the waves. Less than 10% of a whale's body is visible. And for us, the most important part was seeing the tail, which acts as almost a fingerprint and helps us to identify individuals. The hard part is not every whale breached, which means we never saw their tails sometimes. It's the morning of day two. We are just heading back to the boat this morning and bringing Mr. Whale for good luck. So hopefully we see lots of critters out there. Today I'm aft lookout, so I'll be standing on the top deck just looking out for whales and dolphins. On day two, we searched for more than 100 kilometers, circumnavigating the island of Pico across from Fayel. It was a quiet day, not even picking up any clicks on the hydrophone. But as the afternoon came, we got a call from one of the lookout towers saying that humpbacks were in the area. Racing to the other end of the island, we found a juvenile feeding in the shallow waters offshore. This was one of our target species. And one of the coolest things about this humpback was that because of all the stuff it was eating, it was stirring up a lot of remnants that the birds were loving. So there were hundreds upon hundreds of birds in this area as well. We managed to get some great photos of this whale's tail, and upon closer look, it seemed like this whale had probably been struck by a boat at some point, as his fin was scarred. Lisa would be taking a closer look on her return to shore to see what she could learn. On day three at sea, we returned to the boat for some very rough weather. Like the day prior, it took hours to find any whales, but our hydrophone picked up clicks that day and we followed them closer and closer, finally seeing several sperm whales miles and miles from shore.
The return to Horta was a rough one that day, driving right through a rainstorm with large swells and pelting rain. Lisa shared our findings from the day after dinner, happily sharing that several of our photo IDs matched whales from years prior. Find out that the sperm whales from these oars have gone to the Canary Islands and Madeira, and some of the big males matched to Norway and Iceland. And I'm I'm one of the kind of the main matcher for the North Atlantic, so I know some of the other movements. We had a match 2017 that was amazing from the Gulf of Mexico that was seen there in 2002 and here in 2017, so very slowly, just through photographs, we're working out uh, where the sperm whales are moving to. This means that our research was paying off because Lisa was actually able to match some of the whales we'd seen that day with whales she had seen in years prior. Many years ago now, I got a master's degree in environmental management, and my hope was that one day I could take the money that I had earned in a lucrative career and use it to help with conservation work and spend more time working with wildlife. So a trip like this was really a way for me to be able to give back and do some of the things that drew me into getting that master's degree in the first place. Now, I will say that this trip is certainly not for everyone. It is voluntourism. You are paying to be a researcher, so you are working most of the day. There was a little bit of time for free time after we got off the boat and before we had our evening dinner and lectures. But other than that, your day is consumed with being out on the boat, making sure you are getting the findings that Lisa needs, and making sure that at the end of the day that data is going into the right channels. So it is a work trip in a way, but if you wanna be part of conservation work, then this is a great trip for you. They don't just have trips to work with the whales, but different animals all over the world from elephants and cheetahs to unique and exotic animals all over the world. I'm gonna drop some links in the description of this video if you wanna learn more about biosphere expeditions and also if you wanna get involved in whale research. Now, it's not just scientists or people that are going on these conservation trips that can get involved. There's a website called Happy Whale and this website allows anyone that's out potentially on a whale watch or just out at sea to take any photographs that they have of whale flukes or depending on the whale, the back of the whale and upload it into their system. It uses AI to be able to compare those photos to other whales around the world. And you can be part of scientific research by just uploading your photos of whales in that way. So it's a really nice, inexpensive way to be part of the scientific research that's going on around the world. Now I'm going to show a video from their website here so you can see just how many whale sightings have taken place in the Azores island chains over the years. There are so many of them. This is such a hot spot for whales, which is why whale tourism is such a big money maker in these islands. Now I've got a bunch of videos coming out from the Azores. I actually also came to this island chain about eight years ago and have some other videos already up on the channel if you wanna learn more about the Azores. It is one of the most phenomenal, nature-rich places I've visited, has a ton of biodiversity. As I said in the beginning of this video, it's also the only archipelago to be certified by EarthCheck as a sustainable island chain. So they're doing a lot of the right things, but if over tourism happens, a lot of that will change. So come check this place out, maybe in the off season. And again, if you wanna learn more about Biosphere or doing some nonprofit volunteer vacations, check out the links down in the description. And I'm really excited to share with you guys 
some of the other videos that I'm going to be making from this island chain. As always, I'm Alice Ford. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and drop a comment down below if you have any questions. I'll also have a blog post out on my blog with more information on this experience, which you can check out in the description below.